On March 7, 2020, Governor Cuomo issued Executive Order 202 declaring a state of emergency in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. On March 13, 2020, Governor Cuomo issued Executive Order 202.1, which included a suspension of law uh, allowing the attendance of meetings telephonically or other uh, similar service, Article 7 of the Public Officers Law, uh, to the extent necessary to permit any public body to meet and take act, such actions authorized by the law without permitting uh, public in-person access to meetings uh, and authorizing such meetings to be held remotely by conference call or similar service, provided that the public has the ability to view or listen to such proceeding and that such proceedings are recorded and later transcribed. In accordance with the executive order, this um, meeting is held by a video conference with a live stream found uh, at the CUNY Board of Trustees website. A copy of the calendar, uh, the agenda, is also available on CUNY <laughs> Board of Trustees website. Additional items may be added during the meeting. As a reminder, please mute your audio so that we can ensure that everyone can hear. And I'd like to ask um, Secretary to take a roll call attendance of members of the Chancellor's Office and other invited guests. So, uh, members of the Chancellery, just uh, respond present. Uh, Chancellor Matos Rodriguez. Present. Uh, General Counsel and Senior Vice Chancellor for Legal Affairs, Derek Davis. Present. Uh, Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost, Jose Luis Cruz. Present. Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer, Hector Batista. I saw Hector. He's there. He might be mute. Yeah. Yeah. You think he's muted? There's a I see him. Figure. Well, yeah. Senior Vice Chancellor Matt Sapienza. Present. Vice Chancellor Brian Cohen. He may be muted also. I saw him. Okay. We'll come back to that. Uh, Dean uh, Mogulescu. Uh, present. Excellent. Dean El Mahandas. Okay. We'll come back. Uh, Mitch Gibson, Senior Advisor and Deputy Chief of Staff to the COO. Present. Excellent. Professor Michael Jacobson from the Institute for State and Local Governance. Present. Linda Kleinbaum from the Institute for State and Local Governance. Present. Excellent. So, uh, Hector, were you able to, uh, are you still muted or are you having a sound issue? And Brian Cohn also. Okay. Gail, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Is that Brian? Yes. Sorry, I had a problem okay, with my great. audio, so I'm called in. But I'm still on the Okay, video. great. Terrific. We're, so we're just missing Hector's um, audio, which I think is going to be, he should call in also if you guys want to text. I sent him the number earlier for the last meeting, so he has it. He may not realize it's the same. I will text him. I send it to him now again. Yeah, I just them because he needs to give the, the presentation, right? One of our student representatives is standing by for conference call access. He doesn't have sound coming through, though. So please direct him to call the conference call number. I did. Tisha, Tisha's, work, yeah, Tisha's working on it. Okay. Secretary Horowitz, I'd like to have my presence noted as well as a trustee. Oh, great. Thanks, uh, Trustee Burke. Thank you. I got you now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are we all set? Yes. Uh, Hector's dialing in, but I think you have a few things to say before he's up, so I think you'll be okay. Okay. Um, 
Let me just clarify one uh, suggestion I made to the committee members. Um, you're asked to mute while you're not speaking. If you wish to speak, obviously unmute. Uh, and then go back to mute so that we can all uh, hear one another. Uh, now let's turn to the items requiring a vote immediately. Given that all board members are participating remotely, I'll announce the resolutions and ask for members to respond only if you'd like to abstain or oppose an item. Otherwise, your vote will be recorded as a yes vote. If you're voting no or abstaining, please state your name and vote. Um, additionally, if you wish to second an item or have any questions, please state your name first for the record, uh, and let's try to avoid speaking over one another. Uh, let's um, action item 1A is the approval of the minutes of March 9, 2020. Um, I'll move approval of action item 1A. Do I have a second? Is there a second? Berger seconds. Second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, if, um, if there are no changes um, or discussion on this, um, is there any? Now we'll have a vote. Please only respond if you wish to abstain or oppose. All abstaining? All opposed? The minutes are approved. And now I'll call upon Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer Hector Batista to introduce <laughs> the information item, which is a report by the Institute State and Local Governance uh, on the efficiencies for reinvestment and um, innovation, ERI initiative. Uh, and um, He's still dialing in. Okay, well then, you know, he can uh, come in in a moment. Let me ask Professor Jacobson um, to present his report. Uh, and please give us a moment while the secretary shares the presentation on your screens. That's the um, ISLG report. You might recall, just for clarification, that this report was referenced at our last board meeting when uh, we asked uh, uh, what happened to our savings targets uh, a couple of years ago, what the status of all that work was. Professor Jacobson? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll, uh, myself and my colleague, uh, Linda Kleinbaum, who's also on the phone, will run through these charts. I mean, we'll get into some detail. So if, you know, you or the other board members want us to go slower or faster, just let us know. But we have a fair amount of material to cover. So we're just going to go through and I, I think Gail will do the slides and I'll start talking. So um, is this okay? Is, can everyone hear me? Sure. Okay. So this entire presentation uh, is an update on what was previously called the Administrative Excellent Initiative. Uh, it probably makes sense before jumping in uh, uh, to remind the committee both about ISLG itself. Um, and yeah, I'm sorry. I'm on the call now. Oh, oh great. Thanks, Doctor. So can I start? Okay. okay. Uh, one, one moment. Uh, Professor Jacobson, would you mind holding off on that? No, no, that's, uh, that's fine. Our, that's fine. Our COO is on the line. Sure. Uh, and he'll begin. Sure. Please proceed. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Ferrer. And I'm sorry to the committee for the technical difficulties that I have. As the board recalled, in early 2017, the board approved Harry McKinsey to conduct a study to find opportunities to improve the operations efficiencies and realize savings. After three months of engagement, McKinsey identified multiple opportunities that could save CUNY up to $75 million. In 2017, CUNY hired the ISLG to help lead the implementation of this opportunity and to conduct the same assessment in the Office of Academic Affairs. The ISLG identified additional opportunities that, like the work performed on the operational side of the house, 
to result in savings. A comprehensive plan called the Administrative Excellence was then developed that included high priority operations and academic projects. Under the leadership of Chancellor Matos Rodriguez, this comprehensive plan is now referred to as the Efficiency Reinvestment and Innovation, or ERI. I've asked two members of my staff to help me in this conversation and answer any questions. Matt Sapienza, ABC, for Budget and Finance, and Mitch Gibson, who oversees this project. As you know, we could continue to collaborate with the ISLG leadership in this initiative. I'm now going to turn it over to Michael Jackson to give you a fiscal committee an update on ERI. I will come back and do some additional uh, PowerPoint presentation of where CUNY is with regards to this particular project. Thank you, Chairman Ferrer. And now, Michael. Professor Jacobson, please proceed. Okay, thanks, Hector. Um, so just quickly, just quickly on some background. Um, so ISLG, for those of you who don't know, we're at a, an institute in CUNY. We're about six or seven years old now. Uh, there's about 60 full-time staff at CUNY, we, uh, at the Institute, we work on a number of initiatives uh, uh, locally and around the country. We have a fair amount of government, academic, uh, and fiscal expertise in our staff. Uh, and this is one of the projects that we're engaged in. Um, so getting to the background of this initiative, uh, Mark Shaw, who of course you all know uh, when he was the CUNY COO, brought in Meg Egan to direct strategic initiatives uh, with uh, re-engineering and HR among those. He also named her acting uh, VC for human resources. Both Mark and Meg's salaries were included in the costs of the ISLG contract from fiscal 18 to 20. Um, so about, uh, about a third of our spend um, in those years were paying their salaries through ISLG. Essentially, they each had two jobs, their job at CUNY and their job uh, uh, helping manage this initiative. Uh, given the focus on strategic improvement in HR, the team worked on various aspects of HR operations, improving all elements of the process that could be improved. In the near term, these efforts were not project specific. You won't see them in this presentation, but um, like a lot of other things we do, um, we did that work and you're just not seeing it as part of the initiatives. Uh, and so another example of that is we recommended changes to the HR search committee process that have been adopted, developed an e-signer policy, uh, approved by the board and implemented uh, at CUNY. So in parallel with these efforts, the ISLG team embedded as it were within CUNY, as well as ISLG evaluated McKinsey's diagnostic recommendations based on their three month effort in the context of CUNY needs and capabilities. The specific projects we're gonna go over represent the, re the results of that evaluation. I should say quickly, um, I can't totally answer this myself to the, to, the, and to the question of why not McKinsey, why ISLG. I think the thinking was that we had the right combination of expertise, uh, cost to meet CUNY's needs. Uh, we're already embedded in the university. We're familiar with CUNY and academic uh, administration. Uh, uh, McKinsey also would have cost multiple times what we cost. So I think that's how the decision was made um, to hire us. Okay, Gail, you can go to slide two. Um, so you see the table of contents for the presentation. Uh, I'm going to do a sort of overview of the presentation at sort of a high level. The, we'll then get into the administrative initiatives and timelines, the academic initiatives and timelines, the savings methodology, the near and long-term save, and the total uh, estimated savings. Uh, we won't go through all the appendices, but you can obviously go through them or you know, reference them if you like, and we can discuss them. Um, okay, Gail, slide three.
Okay, so as I said, the ERI launched in 2018 as a four-year project, as Hector said, to save $75 million in cumulative savings. Uh, the project started with an initial 90-day diagnostic performed by McKinsey and Company. It identified opportunities in six administrative functions, HR, IT, procurement, enrollment management, finance, and facilities, and it focused in most of those areas on the notion of shared services. As I mentioned in the intro, ISLG undertook a comprehensive assessment of these six administrative functions to identify stakeholder priorities that would yield efficiencies, better customer service, and best-in-class business process. ISLG evolved McKinsey's diagnostic into the following. Uh, human resources, systems for payroll, time and leave, that would form the foundation for efficient, effective shared operations. IT, an evaluation of a replacement for PeopleSoft to address many of the shortcomings identified by all the stakeholders we talked to. An evaluation of a government process, a governance process, sorry, for strategic IT projects to ensure implementation of priority projects across the university. In procurement, we focused on an e-marketplace to rationalize spend and maximize volume discount, as well as evolving the procurement de department into a strategic, ultimately shared service. Enrollment management focused on automation opportunities to save millions of dollars. Finance focused on creating a stronger foundation through a proposed four-year financial pr planning process. Uh, facilities has been largely put on hold given the priorities of the VC of uh, facilities at the time. Uh, while Vita Rabinowitz was acting chancellor, she expanded the focus of the initiative to include academic operations, specifically an in-depth evaluation of transfer issues and adult and continuing education opportunities. And we'll get into that in a few minutes. Slide four, Gail. So ISLG has identified opportunities for administrative and academic functions to more effectively support CUNY's mission. These six projects seek to improve service, support, automation, and make processes more effective and efficient. The projects which drive automation of manual processes or move systems to the cloud are critical investments for CUNY, not only to save money, but to enable remote work arrangements, especially critical now. Those administrative projects are as follows. Uh, the first is to develop and implement a new fiscal plan, primarily a four-year plan. Larry and Angelo has been leading that effort in ISLG to create that plan and a PEG plan for CUNY. You probably all know Larry and from her role at Gutman and her leadership position as the first deputy budget director at OMB in the city. Uh, the PEG program, which a lot of us at ISLG have experience in, is a comprehensive way to implement monitor cost reduction initiatives, which will be crucial to CUNY moving forward again, especially now. Uh, a PEG program is what guided New York City during its fiscal crisis, and we feel strongly it can do so for CUNY. We expect to return to the board with an update on this shortly. Secondly, IT. That involves modernizing CUNY first, Prioritize software as a, as a service, human capital management solution, basically the cloud system to manage HR, modernize provision of telecoms, develop and support implementation of a strategic procurement plan. This includes uh, establishing an e-marketplace, which a number of people are working on now, both at ISLG and in CUNY. The academic projects are as follows. We're developing a roadmap for transfer improvement and transfer credit data reporting. While you see that savings here are listed as TBD, which we'll go over, with transfers representing over 60% of CUNY students, improvements suggested by ISLG aim to both decrease significantly stopouts of transfers and make CUNY more attractive to transfer students, both of which have uh, hugely significant implications for higher enrollments and tuition. In terms of adult and continuing education, ACE, we're developing an RFP for ACE student information system and descriptive data reports and supporting implementation of enrollment management and financial aid savings initiatives. 
All those things I just mentioned, we're gonna get into on in a little more detail in a few minutes. Slide five, Gail. Um, so the, the ISLG's process, uh, the way we did this is a huge number of stakeholder interviews, including interviews with uh, 50 business owners of various projects across functional areas, workshops for specific projects that involve dozens of central and campus staff for each initiative with subject matter experts and operational staff. Um, all those interviews, focus groups, uh, business planning, uh, organizational mapping, uh, all of those inform the ISLG's current state assessments of each project. The findings from all of these reveal that CUNY faced challenges with the following. One, systemic vision and agenda setting. Two, governance. Three, responsibility, accountability, and authority. Clarity of established policies and procedures. Budget transparency and management. And moving with urgency to identify and implement priorities. Set and meet deadlines and meet cost estimates. Our initiatives all work to try to resolve those challenges. So I'm now gonna turn this over to my colleague, uh, Linda Kleinbaum, who has uh, been involved on the ground for most of this work while it's been implemented and she'll start taking us through uh, some of the specific initiatives before we turn back to the near-term and long-term savings. Linda? Thanks, Michael. Gail, if we can have slide six. So this is an example for you all of what Michael just talked about. This was um, one of our looks to eliminate pain points, establish clear lines of responsibility and accountability and authority and lean a process. This map is just a snippet of a process map that we did for commercial off the shelf software procurements, COTS procurements, which uh, we were hearing lots of issues coming forward from the campuses. So what I wanna just give you a sense of is how we use processes such as these to overcome the, um, the things that we thought needed to be fixed to make the process better. So the first red box you see there uh, refers to problems that were had with the submission of requisitions. Requisitions would often come in without the right or sufficient information on them, which would require a back and forth between procurement and the campuses until the information was right. Um, so ISLG developed a one-page requisition guide and a requisition supplement, which provided guidance to people filling out requisitions to ensure that the proper information came in. The second red box you see there refers to uh, various approval levels that were required at the campuses, um, with many campuses requiring up to three approval levels, which could take as much as 10 days. ISLG evaluated the size of the procurements and the strategic concerns associated with the procurements and recommended that for most procurements, one level of approval would be sufficient reducing the 10 days to one or two days. This red box has to do with um, procurements such as this would require an IT sign-off. So this spe we specifically built that sign-off into the process automatically, as well as creating um, service level agreements for the amount of time that would be expected to be taken to get that IT approval. And finally, what's shown here, the last of the red boxes, is um, when a procurement would fail budget check, it would stay there until the customer took some affirmative action to find out whether it had uh, passed budget check or not. ISLG worked with CIS to develop an automated process. So if a procurement now fails budget check, the customer will um, receive an email informing them of that 
and it can they can go in and fix it. So this is just a taste of how we approach ideas of responsibility, accountability, authority, and leaning process. But the the larger point on the COTS and on procurement was we tried to put responsibility and accountability more directly in the hands of procurement, take out a lot of what had been in the hands of legal at the time um, and put it back uh, with procurement, which is the real owner of the process. And we believe these changes, which we'll talk about in a bit when, when we work with a new um, director of strategic procurement, these changes can be institutionalized more broadly across procurement in CUNY um, and to the benefit of the processes. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please, Gail. Slide seven. So Michael talked about many of these projects. What this shows you is a timeline for the uh, administrative initiatives. So the line on the chart is develop and implement the new fiscal plan. So what this shows you is the steps in an inclusive budget process that covers the calendar year and meshes with the city and state budget timelines. The chancellor would be speaking with the city and state in December about the FY21 budget while vice chancellors are formulating proposals and gathering ideas from the colleges for the FY22 budget. So it creates a comprehensive approach to bring priorities up and out. The blue set of lines on this chart show IT initiatives. I'm getting some feedback, I hope you're not. Um, first line refers to the... I know, I don't know what's causing it. People probably need to mute. If everybody could go on mute. All right, let's try again. Yeah, I don't know what's... I'll move further. No, closer. I'll just try and keep going. The IT lines, the first line on the chart refers to the work we did relative to uh, the ERP. Linda, are you on? Linda, are you on um, your phone or are you on the computer? I'm on the computer. Oh, okay. Oh, there you're better now. Okay, yeah. you're back. Yep. Sorry about that, everyone. So the first line um, under the green, I mean the blue for IT, shows uh, the work we were doing on upgrading to a cloud-based ERP system, given among other things the anticipated benefits that a cloud-based system would offer in terms of transforming business processes that could lead to sizable reductions in operational and administrative costs. Um, so much of that work is, is available. We had developed requirements for payroll and for time and leave, and those requirements, we could add the remaining HR requirements and be prepared whenever CUNY is ready to issue an RFP for an HCM, which is a human capital management system in the cloud to manage those components of CUNY's work. The interesting thing, or the critical thing about cloud-based computing um, for ERP at this point in time is that it takes the management off of an on-prem requirement and puts it in the cloud, which given the emergency we've been through is a significant consideration. The second line within the blue is work that ISLG has been doing on strategic IT project governance. We've recently submitted a draft of a governance plan um, to CUNY, and it looks to ensure a structure for setting priorities among strategic IT projects CUNY-wide. The third blue line refers to work we've been doing in telecom for IT. This was an area which CIS had identified early on to us as having potential savings opportunities 
Um, a vendor also had done a presentation for CUNY and spoke to significant savings opportunities here as well. We have been, ISLG has done an examination through accounts payable of spend in this area. It's very hard to get all of the asset information that's necessary. We did an RFI and recently have gotten RFI responses from 10 vendors. And now we're looking at what savings might be achieved if we went out to the marketplace with an RFP. The last set of projects shown here relate, relate to the implementation of a strategic procurement plan. I want to start with the bottom one, bottom item first, which is the e-marketplace. E-marketplace is a really exciting uh, implementation. It's sort of like CUNY having uh, the Amazon marketplace at your fingertips to get any, um, any commodities that you might need. It's currently in the proposal review stage. An RFP went out, proposals have come in, and the selection committee is evaluating those proposals, which hopefully means that in the not too distant future, CUNY can have an e-marketplace. The research tells us that um, any organization that goes to an e-marketplace can save between 20 to 30 percent of applicable spend and these e-marketplace solutions are basically out-of-the-box cloud-based solutions. So this is an effort we've been really trying to move with CUNY on. The top line under procurement is working with CUNY on the creation or the enhancement of the current procurement organization into a strategic procurement office with uh, people who are responsible for sourcing and for assessing the strategic value of your contracts. Uh, once a new strategic procurement officer is appointed, ISLG will work with them to create that kind of a system. If we can move to slide eight, Gail. So this shows you the timeline for the academic initiatives. So the first here is for transfer improvements. ISLG has done a lot of work in transfers. We did, we held numerous workshops with transfer staff from both sending and receiving schools. Based on that, we developed a roadmap of findings, recommendations for CUNY, which are being used by the Transfer Steering Committee. There are lots of opportunities in transfer that could make the experience much more successful for transfer students, and we're currently working with the Transfer Steering Committee on some of those, uh, including developing a website for transfers and a process to get transfer students equivalencies earlier in their decision-making process. We also developed in relation to transfer a report that measures transfer credit loss. This report didn't exist before. Uh, it allows by school um, schools to see what's happening to their students when they transfer from a CUNY community college to a CUNY senior college. It is, um, it's really a great system and it will allow schools to set goals and measure against those goals. And we're currently in the process of, de of developing a dashboard to be able to give to CUNY to see um, on your dashboard how you're doing relative to those goals and those targets. The next academic initiative is ACE. We've been working very closely with CUNY on the Adult and Continuing Education Program. You know you currently do not have a CUNY-wide student information system for ACE. And during this crisis, I think it really points out the value of that kind of system. You would have been able to reach out to all ACE students to inform them about how you were proceeding with classes and other aspects of the program. There was a request that went to ACE for I think it asked for your list of phlebotomy students. 
um, that was asked for by the state, which became very difficult to produce. It was produced, but it was an effort. So we've been working on putting together the requirements for a CUNY-wide uh, student information system for ACE, and we have those, and we are now working with ACE and CUNY procurement to um, see if we can't bring on a vendor to provide that system. We also have done data analytics for every ACE school to show them how they're faring relative to their programs in terms of profit and enrollment and other critical indicators. And we use that information to do a CUNY-wide report to show schools how they compare to each other which is really a report designed to whet the appetite for a CUNY, um, CUNY wide student information system. And I think it did just that. The last set of boxes here, I guess you would call them peach colored, um, refer to a number of initiatives that ISLG is supporting relative to enrollment management and financial aid. So let me say about enrollment management, it's a host of initiatives to automate processes in the registrar's office. It's automating reporting of clearinghouse data, automating Excelsior verification, automating the graduation audit, uh, electronic transcripts, automated class scheduler, and class and events management system. These projects do an enormous amount to make the process of students registering um, more simplified, quicker, um, it relieves work from many, many uh, staff at the schools. These projects initially were projects that were under the operations heading, uh, and then when the new provost came in, they were moved to academics because the registrar function uh, was moved to academics. But there are tremendous opportunities here. Um, they, their ability to be captured depends on setting priorities for their implementation. We have, um, in a separate handout that was provided to you, shown you business cases for the savings for each of these, and Michael will talk about that in a bit. The bottom set of peach boxes refers to two financial aid uh, initiatives that we have underway. One is to expand um, nudges, which are behavioral messages to students reminding them to fill in their FAFSA forms. And the other is a process to automate most of the work on verifying FAFSA. This, the importance of this has come up certainly in the context of COVID where stimulus money is identified by virtue of FAFSA eligibility. But even more than that, this is, these are critical, uh, critical steps to help our students achieve and succeed in getting their FAFSA, which we know is so important to keeping them uh, enrolled and having successful careers at CUNY. I can't say enough, how, especially the FAFSA verification, how much it will add to a smooth process for students and allow more of them to succeed at verifying. So if we can move to slide nine, Michael's going to talk to you about um, the savings that we've calculated, but I just wanted to take a moment to um, tell you how from all these initiatives, how we determine the savings. And we, as I said, we had submitted with this a document with tabs. So every one of the initiatives, we show you the business case that was developed to determine how much we thought the initiative could save. And savings are primarily uh, identified in two. Yep. Is that, is that the uh, appendix way at the end of the report? It said it was the Appendix business, the 3. Business. Yes, it was Appendix 3, and it was sent as a separate document with a memo describing um, the various tabs and then an Excel document which has 12 tabs, 13, a summary, and then 12 tabs. 
the, uh, the materials were included uh, in what Matt sent all of the trustees this weekend. Uh, there was an Excel document and another um, which has all the tabs. I can pull it up if you want to see that during the meeting. I have it loaded. I have coming up, I have an example from one of them, which just gives the flavor for what we did. So the savings from the initiatives primarily come from one of one of two sources or both. Their productivity savings, which would be time spent in the current state as compared to time spent in the future state um, with the reduction in time having the value uh, based on an average of the salary for the people conducting the work. The other savings is retention savings, where we estimated increased revenue from increased enrollments uh, from projects that reduce stopouts or, or, gen or increase enrollment. Relative to capturing these savings, we are currently in the process of standardizing a framework um, that would be one that we would put in place with stakeholders at Central and the campuses, HR, finance, and then the campus representatives to develop a mechanism to capture savings through attrition and redeployment where, the pro where it is based on productivity savings. So the next slide, slide 10, is, is an abbreviated version of one of those business cases that's in the material that we sent. And this is for FAFSA verification, which is one of my favorite um, projects because it will go such a long way in ensuring successful verification by students without enormously uh, overburdening financial aid officers uh, in following up and tracking down um, all of the things they have to do currently for verification. So what you see here, and again, this is not all of the lines, but you see that we have a um, current state, and on the current state we show on line five the total enrollments following verification, and we have how much a tuition would be, so we have the total revenue after verification in the current state. When you move to the future state, you can see that we have total enrollment following verification on line 14, and it's higher. And that's because the expectation and what we've seen from the research is that you will more successfully uh, allow students to verify with this automated system. And I think these numbers are very conservative. Again, multiplied by the average tuition, you get the value of tuition after verification. And then the difference between line 16 and line 8 is the value of this initiative relative to retention. So it's got a $15 million retention value. Then the next thing we did is looked at productivity. As I mentioned earlier, people currently doing financial aid spend an enormous amount of time uh, on uh, FAFSA verifications. This eliminates most of that time. This shows you what we estimated as the total FTEs impacted by elimination of that time times an average salary, which gives you an annual estimated productivity savings. And then we also give for you the cost. Um, this project is one of uh, the, the, uh, one project that significantly saves over the cost of the project. And now I'll turn it to Michael, who will go through the estimated savings that these business cases showed for near-term and longer-term initiatives. Thanks, Linda. So I know we're. Um... I don't want to take up too much of your time, and so I'm just going to uh, jump right into these uh, charts. This is slide 11, Gail. Um, I mean, they're pretty self-explanatory for those administrative and academic initiatives we described earlier. Uh, you can see the net savings uh, estimates for initiatives that are expected to be implemented and captured in what we're calling the near term, that is already accruing or 
are expected to the period from 20 to 21. In the period from 22 onwards, near-term initiatives uh, supported by ISLG working with CUNY are expected to account for more than $55 million in our estimates in annual net savings to CUNY. These are comprised of a variety of savings initiatives, largely those associated with automation of various initiatives and enrollment management and financial project area. Um, no, as Linda was just saying, the FAFSA verification only shows its cost. However, if it's implemented before the end of fiscal 20, the productivity savings associated with FAFSA verification may well be captured in the second half of 21. A half year productivity benefit in 21, for example, would be worth about $3 million CUNY. In some cases, you see a range of net savings. <clears throat> uh, uh, and they're offered for initiatives that are yet to be implemented. And so based on uncertainty of implementation date and timeframes, uh, we were more comfortable doing a, a, a range uh, than a single number. Uh, you can see footnotes attached to these numbers are very detailed along with the calculation methodology, also very detailed. And in the business cases, the spreadsheets that we provide as supporting materials to the presentation, you'll see all our assumptions about um, savings and how we got there and the methodology and what's behind them. You know, we've tried to be very conservative here. This is, you know, a lot of us have worked in, in these sort of areas for a long time. It's not our sort of first rodeo. We're not, we're not trying to overstate the savings, um, but we're, we're trying to put out what we think reasonably uh, can be achieved. If you go to slide 12, Gail, you'll see the <clears throat> equivalent of that for the estimated savings for what we're calling longer term initiatives, um, those that are <clears throat> uh, as yet less solidified than our near term initiatives or expected to accrue in the period in the period from fiscal 22 onwards. You can <laughs> see that we estimate from FY22 on the longer term initiatives. Um, which we are supporting will account for around $20 million in annual net savings to CUNY with significant additional savings noted as TBD since they are not yet sufficiently far enough along to estimate the savings potential. And again, all our conservative numbers from our point of view, even the big ones that you're seeing in e-marketplace, we think are reasonable and conservative. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, again, in some cases, a range of net savings are offered that for uh, initiatives that are yet to be implemented. Um, and, you know, again, I encourage you to take a look at the supporting business cases spreadsheet. Um, if you have any questions about how we came to any of these numbers. So uh, slide 13, which is the last slide in the deck. Um, is at the bottom line is uh, through our efforts working with CUNY, we expect to see a total net savings of between 30 and 56 million for the period from FY20 to 21, and total annual net savings of more than 75 million um, from 22 onwards. And as I've said uh, several times, we believe the higher end of the range is achievable if these projects are treated as priorities and their implementation is expedited. While CUNY can decide, obviously, how to budget these savings, uh, a commitment to achieving the maximum value is essential to achieving that. Won't go into the, appendis the appendices. I'd like to thank the board for this opportunity, certainly to our colleagues at CUNY and IT and the budget for um, being partners in this. And I'll uh, stop. And obviously, we're happy to answer any questions any of you might. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, is there, are there any questions from the committee members? I do have a question. This is Razia Ravi, student representative. So my question is, um, actually, it was about this slide eight. Um, while. Uh, the presentation was going on. I know um, I heard about the um, transfer students, about the transfer students, and um, coming with the coming up with the in, uh, initiative and implementation phase. I was wondering if any students, any sample of students within transfer, has been um, either 
in terms of a focus group or, or in terms of like just um, getting ideas has been consulted because I did um, hear the transfer staff has been um, uh, uh, involved in this process, but I, I did not hear if any students was involved throughout the process of um, looking what they need in terms of academic success uh, for the transfer uh, initiative. Right, so let me take that. That's a great question. So relative to the work that we were doing, we interviewed staff, but I can tell you there are several projects going on within CUNY that are geared towards improving the transfer process. And several of them, I don't know off the top of my head their names, have in fact um, dealt with students, including the Provost Transfer Committee, where um, student input has also been, um, been garnered. So I can get you that information. I don't have it off the top of my head, but students have been talked to about this. I could also tell you that in talking to the staff associated with transfer, they, um, they very personally feel the pain of the transfer students and were quite open with us about things that they would like to be able to do better, um, where they need some tools to help and I think we got a fairly robust sense of the process from them. Not to say that students aren't important, they are, and they are being addressed in other projects, and I can get you those names. Thank you so much. No, I just, I was wondering, because this is actually a bit, this is an issue near and um, dear to heart. I think 60% of students in CUNY are transfer, and I can assure you, I know that there has been um, efforts locally on the campuses in order to like understand the transfer students needs to do the transfer um, staff on the local campuses. But um, I think it will work just to make a suggestion or assertion, if you may, it, through uh, the implementation process, if, you know, while you're going through these phases, if also um, somehow we can incorporate the students um, just in terms of like how they are impacted or how they can see the change throughout the process because I think it will be effective in terms of what now the staff see and how it is being, you know, translated to the action that needs to really be implemented to gear towards the transfer students. Just a suggestion. Right. That, bring, that's actually all. Thank right. you so much. I'll bring that suggestion to the Thank transfer you. steering committee. Thank you. And Linda, as you as you develop that information, may I ask that in this and other issues that you send that information to the secretary, to the board, so you make sure, you make sure that all the members of the committee receives it? Happy to, yes. So, thanks. Anyone else? No other questions? Then we're ready to go to uh, our chief operating officer, Hector Batista. Uh, thank you. So in closing of the uh, presentation, uh, I want to give a, uh, an outline of our framework for tracking savings for fiscal year. So as Gail uh, puts the, the presentation up, uh, if we could go to slide two, Gail. Uh, slide two shows uh, the outcomes for FY18 and FY19. The net savings after deducting consulting expenses was 16641392 These savings were achieved by improving the budget planning and spending by finance department and by using in-house staff. That means that we did not incur any unique expenses associated with this, this effort. Note that the expenses incurred by McKinsey in 2017 are also included here. Uh, and because of these efforts, our operation is more efficient. Now let me go. Let me go to slide number three. Slide three, Gail. In the third slide, we have a detailed estimated savings for FY20. It is listed by project, identified by the SOG, and for the most part, 
A lot of the projects are concentrated in the academic affairs area. The two potential outcomes represent the ICRG projected savings and CUNY more conservative projections. We anticipate the net savings after deducting the LCG and Gardner consulting fee to be at least $151,950. If we could go to slide number four. This is FY21. There are three potential outcomes that you see represented here. Our estimate, two estimates by us. Forgive me, one, forgive, one forgive, forgive me, which actually. includes a reach goal. Uh, Gail, I, I think we're on slide five. Ah, good. We're on slide four. Sorry. We anticipate net savings after deducting the LCG consulting fee to, to be at least eleven million six hundred and forty-one thousand one hundred and seventy-five. Now, if we could go to slide number five. This slide represents uh, fiscal year twenty-two. There are two potential outcomes for this slide. The ICG projected savings and CUNY more conservative savings. We anticipate our savings to be about 38,105,325. As we're developing this project and the governance structure, we're gonna create a structure that better oversees, monitors, supports all activity on all these projects. We're also gonna have semi-annual reports which will be uh, distributed to, to the board as we're making progress on all these projects. Each project will be managed by a project team, clearly assigned staff to, sh to assure that each project is completed to, to its fullest. As you know, as the, as the board knows, we're, the CUNY is dealing now with some serious budget uh, issues around connected to COVID-19. So now more than ever, these resources are very important to CUNY, and our goal is to hit every goal that we have identified here to the board. To the board. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee members on this presentation? Well, can no you hear If there Hello? are none, then we're, I'm sorry? Are there any questions? Hearing none, oh, someone has a question. Would you please state it? I think, uh, one of the student representatives, Mr. Mangan, has a, a question, but he can't seem to get audio. Would you please call in, Mr. Mangan? He wanted to ask about the Excelsior stabilization and if it will apply to the other scholarships. Right, so that initiative at the moment automates um, the eligibility for Excelsior. Um, it's only applied at this point to that, but that's a <clears throat> tremendous savings. Uh, I will look into whether there are opportunities to automate processes relative to others. Okay. Uh, and, and also, if the SIS for eight, for eight will be expanded to BMI and citizenship now. Uh, Anyone want to take a, anybody want to take a swing at that? Yeah, I can't answer that. I can say that um, we're looking at it for each of the um, continuing ed programs at each of the campuses. Um, but I'm not, and that will take a while, so I'm not sure about expanding it at this point. But I will look into Hector, that. Matt, do you have anything to add to that? Yes. Uh, uh, no, that, uh, go ahead, Matt. Sorry, Hector. Um, we can't hear you, Matt. Okay. 
Last thing he said was sorry, Hector. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, right. Sorry about that. Um, Kason, it's answer your question. The, the BMI, the Black Male Initiative, the students that are in the Black Male Initiative are already in the CUNY First system. Um, so mm -hmm. um, the ACE students are not, and that's why the work's going on to try to um, implement them as, as part of, um, in part of the student system. Black Male Initiative students are already in there. Um, Citizenship Now is a separate program that students are employed in um, but it's not an academic type of, of program. Um, it's, a, it's a separate type of service program. But black male initiative students already in the CUNY First system. Okay. Uh, are there any further questions on these reports uh, from any member of the committee? Okay. Then we'll Professor take the ben following Nez's items. Hand. I'm sorry? I saw Professor Benton's hand up. Oh, I, I didn't see that. Professor Benton, please. Professor Benton, we're all ears. Ned, we can't hear you. Can he hear you? You can see his hand up, right? Would you send him a yeah, message? No, he has, two, he has two hands now. Ned, we can't hear you. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Gail, would you Ned, mind? Ned, you do ESL? He might be able to type the question ASL. into the chat feature. I can only do two, not three languages. He said, never mind. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else? Then if there is none, uh, I'd like to thank you all for your forbearance. This is, um, this is a, um, these are subjects that will come back to us and to the board, uh, since the board has, um, has separately asked ISLG and the chancellor's office to respond to these issues. Um, and that we are mandated to come up with something, not just for coming up with economies, but for investing more in students, which is really what we're doing this, uh, what we're doing this for. Um, now to the policy calendar, I'd like to address section three and uh, policy item 1A is a resolution. We have three resolutions that are IT related and we have a, an abundance of material on that, too, that's important to set a context for these. 1A is a resolution requesting the authorization of a 12-month contract extension for Sierra Cedar Incorporated to continue providing managed hosting services for CUNY First. CUNY First was from the beginning and remains hosted by Sierra Cedar at their Atlanta, Georgia location. In order to reduce the cost to operate the system, CUNY is planning to move the operations to the university-owned data center located at 395 Hudson Street in Manhattan. CUNY is in the process of completing a competitive procurement to identify a third-party vendor that will assist the university in managing and supporting the ERP system at its new location. Uh, however, until the procurement is finalized, the existing contract needs to be extended to accommodate the transition. Contract extension will be for a minimum of 12 months and will not exceed $8,194,824. Uh, uh, and I'll ask Brian Cohen, the Vice Chancellor and CIO, to provide further background. Uh, I think I'm going to take that, uh, Mr. You. Chairman. Uh, this is Hector huh. Batista, and I'm going to start, and I'm going to uh, cover both this one and the next one that's coming on board in my presentation, if you don't mind. We haven't gotten to the next one yet, but uh, go right ahead. Well, thank you for the opportunity to review and discuss the universal need for application management uh, AMS to support CUNY First. 
Since we launched Guinea First in 2007, it has been hosted off-site by Oracle, which is a third-party vendor. Oracle was the original project implementator provider, while they did a fine job for a time. At the end of their contract, Guinea found that they were not following the terms of the agreement, and they were driving up costs. So after 10 years of partnership with Oracle, we decided to go back out to bid for these services and inform the Fiscal Affairs Committee of that. At a 2017 Fiscal Affairs Committee meeting, the following reasons were given to support the need for hosting service. The university data system was over 35 years old and no longer, no longer supporting the needs of the college, of the university. The university did not have a workforce skill and people saw it at a level required to properly respond to the system's issues. And we could not assess a good qualified workforce due to the university's civil service and salary structure. Now I'd like to provide a little background on the previous regarding the data center. It is important to know that CUNY Data Center at 57th Street was built in 1970, mainly to support the academic research and lack the features that we could we needed in order to support today's environment. We had challenges with the cooling system and, and the generators. By the early 2000s, our, our college mainframes, all the computers were moved to the data system at 57th Street. In 2005, the university had been experiencing continuum problems with the data center power, an aging, failing cooling system. So the decision was made to seek a data center, data center option. Houston Street was chosen as the data center location at 395 Houston Street. And in July of 2011, while the data center was operating at 57th Street, plans were approved to renovate and begin an enterprise data system. From 2011 to 2016, the data system renovation project was funded through capital budget. In 2017, McKinsey identified the data center project is a possible cost saving initiative. Then Chancellor Mil Milliken authorized the data center project to proceed. In December 2019, Houston Street Data Center became CUNY primary enterprise data center, with some service still remaining at 57th Street with the plan to really close 57th Street. Now, getting back to the decision to an Oracle contract. In July 2014, CUNY issued an IP for services to migrate CUNY hosting operations of CUNY First application. After the evaluation of the proposed at and after the evaluation of proposals, at and was selected as the as the as the contractor. After several months of negotiation, at and informed CUNY that they sold their business to IBM. IBM informed CUNY that they did not have the, the qualification in order to support the student service part of, the, of CUNY FIRST. So the university sought to really solve this issue. So it went to the controller's office to try to figure out how we could solve this issue. So Sierra Theta uh, was entered into a contract with Sierra Theta. The board approved a contract for three years to support Sierra Theta on May 15, 2017, which will end on May 14 of 2020. The annual cost of approximately of that contract was $9.7 million a year, or total value of 29.2. This contract is expiring on May 15 of this year. I think it's important to know that during the three years of contract with Sierra Cedar, it has fulfilled its hosting and, and met all its obligations satisfactorily. As a reminder, CUNY was, was also building a state of the art data center. So the time to align both of these was, was near, and we needed to figure out how to execute both of these, my, both of these systems. So in August of, August of 30 of 2019, the University issued an RFP for an application management service system for vendors to supplement the CIS staff. A contract selected through a competitive RFP would provide on-site support for people sought HR, finance, students, campus management, and modules. That also supports the faculty, the staff that are depending on this system to run this operation. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about what the procurement process looked like. 
in 2019. Oh, let, let me just interrupt you a second, uh, Hector, because you're not sure. getting into policy item 1B, and that I don't think is fair to the members. Let's sure. do that when we have 1B. So the first one, uh, the first um, policy is really to move a CUNY first from Atlanta uh, to New York to our data center on 57th Street. Hector, is it moving to 57th Street or to Hudson Street? I'm sorry, to move it from from Atlanta to a, a Hudson Street location. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. That's correct. <clears throat> Brian, anything you want to add to that? No, Hector. You actually you you, you cover the issues very well. Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, I covered the first issue. All right. Uh, are there any questions on uh, policy item 1B and the presentation? None from the committee? Then let me uh, uh, state a few facts. Uh, one, uh, and, and this is covered in, um, in a report that is background to this. Uh, the board um, engaged the services of a consultant called Gartner. Uh, would you like me to pull the report up? Sorry, That Freddie. would be helpful. I got that it would right be here. Helpful. Okay. Um, just the Gartner go report. And suggest ways in, we, in which we may uh, modernize uh, uh, QB first and all of the component parts of it. I think it's worth uh, looking at that report to understand what these procurements are and what they may mean in the future. So, for example, on 1A, it is without question that um, Oracle has uh, decided it will no longer support PeopleSoft uh, 9.0, which is the core of that system. Uh, and it's going to serve 9.2 and we're going to go there too. Someone was saying something? Going to PeopleSoft 9.2. And the, the question I think the committee needs to understand is, how long have we been planning to migrate from 9.0 to 9.2, since this hasn't been exactly a secret for a couple of years now. Anybody? Uh, is, is that a question, for Freddie? Yeah. Yeah, it was a question. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start it, and then uh, Brian could um, to jump in. I mean, I I believe that the migration from um, from 9.0 to 9.2 has been something that has been in the works for uh, quite a few years. Um, I, I think that... First time um, we're aware of it. I think there were... Um, well, I'll, I'll let Brian sort of jump in um, to give the history, but I believe the history had... Go ahead, Brian. Why don't you, why don't you jump in? Thank you. Thank you, Hector, and uh, thank you for the question, Trustee of Freer. Um, <clears throat> so back in 2016, and uh, we began to do the upgrade uh, procurement in 2017, September, we issued an RFP off of the, uh, using the New York State backdrop contracts for the Office of General Services. It was their contract for what they call project-based IT systems. 
We had three vendors that were very qualified that responded to that procurement. The procurement was capped at a value of $7.5 million at the time. That was the, the, the threshold for the responses we were allowed to evaluate. Um, we ran into a technical problem with the, with the responses. The state's contract requirements do not allow for offshore resources to be part of the solicitation uh, response, and the three vendors actually provided um, offshore resources, and that reduced their costs. So when we asked them to rebid the um, proposals using um, only um, domestic resources, the value and the cost went up. In March of 2018, I um, contacted the then interim chief operating officer with this issue. In April of 2018, we had a meeting in which we presented to him and others the um, issue associated with the scope of the CUNY first upgrades and next steps. We, um, went, we then went back and tried to ask the state if they would give us an exemption or a waiver for the offshore resources in order to keep the cost of this below. An officer notified then Senior Vice Chancellor Matt Sapienza that he, that he should cancel the procurement. And also in July of the initiative, Meg Egan sent a university email out indicating that ISLG was asked to actually begin to review the CUNY First Upgrade Project, um, which should in May. Um, and when the new chancellor started and when um, the executive vice chancellor and chief operating officer um, started, the CUNY first upgrade project was essentially put on hold. Anyone else? Okay. Is there anything else on... Uh... I'd like the committee members to just take a moment after the meeting and review the Gartner report because there's a lot of stuff there. I have one final question. There are many other questions on, uh, on all of this that, frankly, I won't take the committee's time with on, um, on the uh, migration from 9.0 to 9.2 that uh, people saw. But I want to talk about um, the data center. Now, I believe it was, uh, there was a consensus on the board that we wanted to go to the cloud. And yet it looks like we're, you know, and we may have to, there may be no choice right now to make a, an additional uh, investment in the data center. When will be, we be free of the data center and be in the cloud? Well, there are, the data center does a lot more than just um, support the application like CUNY First. It actually is also the entire network for the university. It's also the storage facilities for the university. Um, and there are certain applications that we run, like for instance, email that comes out of the data center. So we can reduce down the overall footprint of the data center, but in many cases, you will not be completely free of a data center. Answer the question, as opposed to be free of the data center, when are we going to go to the cloud? What's the timetable? Because we've all discussed it. What's a timetable, or at least um, I, we, I think we talked about this probably two years ago. And it has been, I think this was something of concern to all the board members. Since then, I don't think we have seen uh, a timetable, a cost analysis, out how much, you know, when and how much. All those questions, I think, are things that we are of concern to us. So, Senator Thompson, take a crack at this. Um, one of the things that we're we're proposing to do is to make uh, make a presentation to the board on not only uh, CUNY first, but also on the Garner report because I think it's an important report. As as Chairman uh, Ferrer uh, stated, that the board should get a full report, and we will invite Garner to come and make that presentation. I think within that presentation, you're going to see where we are and where we're heading. I think the challenge before um, COVID-19 for the system was the cost of getting to the cloud. I think that the numbers that are thrown in the report, and you'll see for yourself, is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. No, and we were working easier to get capital dollars than it is to get expense dollars to cover this. So I think that um, we we would like to come back to the, to the board, particularly 
probably this committee and, and make a presentation. One thing. And sure. understand that there are those who have done analysis and taking a look at this. And the ISLG mm -hmm. has done shift and change. It, I think it would be very helpful at the very least. We want to take a look, an outside entity to take a look, come back with their recommendations because they said, I think that it would be, we'd love to have the conversation and, and going through this report, that's it from the outside and reviews this. And then comes, and you bring them back in with the addition uh, to this report. So, you know, I understand the concern and the cost and we are in a different world right now. Um, and, and, uh, and yeah, it's a lot easier to get capital dollars than it is expense dollars. Um, but all in all, just let the stations in a review. Okay. Mr. Chairman. That's noted. a very useful suggestion, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate it. I would add something to that. Um, mm -hmm. Chief Operating Officer has suggested that it would cost uh, it's, it's laid out in one of the Gartner reports. I don't know if it's in this particular report that you have, but we'd be happy to provide it to the, uh, okay. to the board. Okay, that would be helpful. Because I've read the report and I don't see, I don't see it, uh, where going to the cloud, uh, and especially with the options that he, the options of the cloud. Be happy to provide that, uh, Jeremy for Okay. Okay. And, uh, Chair, this is, any, this is fellow else? and, and procure for that outside, uh, opinion to provide, uh, the board the information they want. Well, that, that's great, Chancellor. We've been, we've been, I think we're all frustrated with it. Chancellor's office is frustrated with it. Board's frustrated with it. Are we ready for, uh, a vote on item 1B? Are we ready for a vote on 1B? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll move approval of 1B. Do I have a second? Burger seconds. Are there uh, any, uh, uh, any in op? In opposition or abstention? I'm, can, are we voting so on 1A or 1B? Sorry, I thought we were doing I, 1A. I don't think I took. I don't think I took a oh, vote 1A. You 1A. did. Sorry, you did 1A. 1A are the minutes, but one. I'm sorry. 1A oh. is that you didn't vote on the original Sierra Cedar. 1A. 1A, not 1B. Okay, I'll move 1A. 1B, 1A. Ex exactly. I'll second it. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Henry. Thanks, Henry. Uh, all, uh, anyone abstaining or opposing? 1A is approved. I'll move 1B. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Trustee Berger. Reliable. Uh, are there any abstentions or any in opposition? Okay, hearing none, uh, then uh, this uh, uh, is approved as well. Item 1C, the resolution requesting the authorization of a contract with Nagaro incorporated to provide IT services for the enterprise service debt implementation. The implementation will provide improved service delivery to students, faculty, and staff by providing you, an anti on Why are you waiting for me? Can you go cook? Please, please can somebody please mute their phone? Including online help and ticket submission and tracking. University requires the services of a vendor that has implementation expertise. The contract will be for a minimum of 11 months and should not exceed $1,380,000. Brian Cohen will provide further background. 
Thank you, uh, Trustee Ferrer. Um, this is a um, initiative that was originally identified as part of the McKinsey report. Um, this is to um, move all of the um, help desk functions that exist at the colleges, where it is associated with enterprise systems, to the central university's help desk. So it's part of the efficiencies operations and would ultimately then allow the campuses to reduce down their um, workload and then their staffing associated with their help desk. This would also consolidate two of our existing ticket systems that we have today for help desk tickets across the university into one centralized system. It'll provide a lot of efficiencies associated with the users being able to open up help desk tickets online. It'll allow them to track the status of their tickets if they have a question or a problem that needs to be resolved. It also provides a online knowledge portal that um, will provide answers to questions and give greater transparency into the status of our system. Two of our campuses are also adopting the ServiceNow platform. Um, BM, I'm sorry, um, LaGuardia and City College have already um, agreed to um, consolidate their help desk system into the, um, this platform. And we have several other campuses that are also moving in this direction as well. So this is really a step forward toward efficiencies, a shared platform for the university in, in servicing our support and support for our users in our in, in, around our enterprise systems. Okay. Um, are okay. there any uh, questions on this? I'll move approval of item 1C. Do I have a second? Anybody? Second. Second. Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion? Any questions? Hearing none, uh, anyone abstaining or opposing? This item passes. Item 1D is a resolution you, requesting the authorization. I'm sorry. Uh, item 1D is a resolution requesting the authorization of a contract amendment to the Educational Advisory Board Global Incorporated to provide predictive analytics software system to the School of Labor and Urban Studies and to graduate students at our senior colleges. Current contract dated May 9, 2018 provides for a predictive analytic software system that supports the provision of academic advisory systems and database decision making to better facilitate timely progress toward degree completion by the university's undergraduate students. This amendment is expanding the contract to include graduate student population at our senior colleges and the School of Labor and Urban Studies. Contract amendment will not exceed $450,000 over the life of the original contract. And I'd like to ask Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost uh, Jose Luis Cruz to provide further background. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so basically what uh, we are looking to do is to extend the platform, uh, the ABA Navigate platform to our graduate students. Um, and to the School of Labor and Urban Studies, who was not included originally because it did not exist at the time that the that the um, that the original contract was put in place. Um, the schools have found that uh, the platform brings significant value uh, to their work as they try to advise students, retain them, and get them to graduation faster. And so we are presenting uh, this um, proposal to make sure that all of our graduate students as well as LSU is included. Okay. I'll move approval of item 1B. Do I have a second? Second. Um, are there any questions or any discussion on this? Hearing none, all abstaining or opposing? Item 1D is passed. Uh, policy item 2A is a resolution requesting the authorization of a contract between CUNY School of Professional Studies and the New York Historical Society to provide practicum component for the museum studies degree courses that are being offered by SPS. 
museum studies degree offered, for courses available, for experiences, and exhibition design, document handling, and preservation, and curatorial work with a practicum component that will not exceed $1.2 million. And I'll ask Dean John Mogileski to provide further background. Uh, hi, thank you very much. In this city, uh, we started last fall. Uh, we had uh, uh, 50 students to start for a beginning master's year. Um, it's, we are optimistic about the future of the program. One of the main focuses of the program is to try and diversify uh, cultural organizations in this city uh, and beyond. Uh, our our uh, partnership, it's, it's an online degree program, but there is a practicum component at the museum. Uh, there's also for people who are not in this city who are taking the, the program across the country, there, there is live streaming and a whole bunch of other technical aspects of that to let them take this practicum component. Uh, and uh, I'm just delighted with the, with the partnership. Uh, uh, we've been able to raise scholarship money for it. And this provides uh, an opportunity, as again, to, to work with, with uh, this, this wonderful cultural organization and begin to make some dents in the sense of diversifying uh, uh, cultural organizations in this city. Okay, I'll move approval of item 2A. Do I have a second? Um, one of the student representatives asked, was any, take, any feedback taken from students that participated in the program? In Mogileski. Uh, um, could you repeat that? Was there any feedback? Is that, I, the program is in its second semester. It just started in the fall. Uh, the, the, the first semester uh, evaluations uh, were, were outstanding. And the, 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 uh, the wonderful thing is that virtually all of the students who started in that first cohort of 50 students uh, returned. I think we lost two students, which uh, we're, we're, we're very proud of. How many of those 48 net students participated in the survey? Participated in the in practicum is that we surveyed all of the students, but but you know what? I I don't want to <laughs> add a turn here, and I would have to get you that information just to make sure. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Okay, are we ready for a vote? Uh, I'll move item 2A. Do I have a second? Anyone? Uh, second. This is Razia Ravi. Thank you. Anyone abstain Anyone? or opposed? Okay. Policy item 2A is approved. Thank you very much. I'm sorry? Thank you very much. Uh, but there's, a, there's a, actually, sorry, there's another question on the bottom um, from Kaysen. Uh Do students pay additional fees to participate? Uh, it's CUNY. It's CUNY tuition. That's it. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, Item 3A is a resolution requesting the authorization of in-state tuition rate for online degree and certificate programs and authorization of an online infrastructure fee. The Graduate School of Public Health and Public Policy is delivering fully online credit-bearing programs to students. The resident tuition rate has proven crucial to the competitiveness of the online programs at the national and international online education market. The college is proposing that effective fall 2020, all students, resident and non-resident, that enroll in one of the above named programs will be charged the in-state tuition regardless of the residency and that they be charged a $75 online infrastructure fee for um, each term of enrollment. I'll ask Dean Amen El Mahandas to provide 
further background on this. Dr. Omohandis? You know, I, I I think when we took the roll call earlier, I didn't hear uh, I didn't hear Dean Elmahandis on. So if it's okay with uh, Chairman Ferrer, um, I I can introduce this one. What the public health is proposing here um, is something that is modeled um, after similar programs that we have here in CUNY in online degree programs, whether they're resident students and non-resident students, thinking out of where they live and charging the non-resident rate for those programs doesn't seem to make sense when it is a, a distance learning type of um, environment. And also um, did um, consult and get the agreement of their uh, graduate students uh, government association um, for the charging the non-resident rate and for the online infrastructure fee. Um, these new programs that they're bringing online for fall have also gotten the approval of the New York State Education Department. So um, it's something that's modeled after what we have at John Jay College and School of Professional Studies. Um, and again, give, I want to give um, credit to the School of Public Health for their entrepreneurship in not only developing new programs, but developing new online degree programs. Are there any questions? I have one. Um, and I asked you this uh, uh, privately, Matt, but I want to ask you now in the context of the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, these things are never one-offs. So what we're doing here is essentially beginning to make policy for the entire university on a very... Uh, um, on an emerging subject, online degrees. Um, and we're headed to a place where, uh, it seems to me, where there will be an in-state tuition rate, whether you're online or face-to-face. -face. Is that the way you see it? Well, I think you raise an excellent point that um, we're in a distance learning environment now. Um, <clears throat> Due to the the COVID emergency, but um, yeah. as we as we go forward, um, I think the university would like to um, provide more distance learning and more online courses and more online degree programs. Um, so I do think that that's something. As we build more, we, we do have to consider the policy about non-resident students. Right now, um, it's on a very small scale. Um, like I said, School of Professional Studies, John Jay are the ones who have been the leaders in developing online degree programs. Um, and this is the model they used in School, School of Public Health is following that model. But I don't disagree with you that um, as we bring this to scale, I'm gonna have more campuses that have online degree programs that we do have to um, discuss and, and come with a recommendation to the board about how we want to handle the, the tuition rates for non-resident students on a more global level. Well, then why don't we start thinking about that now? Because just like we did with so many other fees, uh, you know, they become policy etched in stone, and then we're sitting on a practice. Yeah. Well, and let me, and let me uh, just parse out the item on the fee, uh, because the fee that School of Public Health is proposing um, John Jay does not have that fee. And one of, one of the main reasons is, is, is because the School of Public Health, their student activity fee is very low. It's one of the lowest in CUNY. It's $40 per student. Um, and just for comparison, John Jay's is $128 uh, per student. So a lot of the activities that happen um, that are paid with the student activity fee, like for instance, orientation, the School of Public Health would use this $70 fee to try to provide that for the students, even though it's an online experience, um, they would get some services um, through the online infrastructure fee. So, um, so that part is something that you know that the School of Public Health is pr proposing that John Jay doesn't currently have. Um, but again, the student activity fee for School of Public Health is so low um, as compared to their their sister colleges that. They're looking for to create some additional resources to pay for some of the online services 
outside of the classroom that need to be provided to these students? Yes, Matt, that's in the in this specific case. I think we're going to have to take a look across the university and see where we're headed with this. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? Yeah, and we can we can come back to the committee and provide a report uh, and work with our colleagues in, in Office of Academic Affairs and provide a report on um, the current menu of online programs and um, you know what what are the current rates that are being charged um, and this way the the committee can get a better sense of of the full um, menu that's out there in terms of online degree programs. Happy to do that, Chairman Fur. I have a question. Okay, question. Um, yeah, this is uh, Trustee Tim Hunter speaking. Um, just a quick, just a quick comment. So um, I understand that the rationale for the the online installation, uh, I guess the online infrastructure fee, is seventy five dollars, and the justification for that is to make up the student activity fee, which is forty dollars. Um, what I don't understand is why the like online infrastructure fee is one higher, and two also being utilized for orientation and and among other things. Um, Student activity fee already in our bylaws already has a couple of guidelines stated there, and a portion of that money does go towards our student government. Um, so even if those things aren't being utilized, I think using like increasing that by thirty five more dollars per student, like you know, uh, like and then trying to justify that, you know, I think that that's something that the board should not consider. Um, and I'm I'm pretty sure that we're going to be making a motion to remove that. I definitely support the in-state tuition, and I don't think of it as like a, oh like like you're doing the students a favor. I mean we're talking about preserving enrollment of students. Students may drop out if the, if this doesn't happen. I'm glad the board is taking the proper actions and the proper procedures necessary to retain these graduate students. But I don't think that that $75 online infrastructure fee is necessary for orientation. Um, I, I think that that's something that should be looked at. Um, you know, at, through some other means, but not through imposing another fee um, on our students that are pursuing degrees online. One of the student so representatives are... asks, would the tech fee be able to cover this fee instead of adding a new one? Also, would an association be made to govern the funding? Um, the tech fee would still, yeah, uh, the tech fee would still be charged um, to the to the students um, who will enroll verse through this online program. So they'll they'll get the tech fee. The online infrastructure fee um, orientation will be one of the items. That was just an example of one of the things that will be covered. But um, any of the additional supports that the students who attend the School of Public Health in person. The, the dean and the provost want to be able to provide that to the students online as well. So whether it's orientation or advising, um, those things need to be provided. And they cost more to do that um, for students that are online than doing it physically in person. Um, and so the, the uh, online infrastructure fee will help cover the costs of those things. It'll be for the students in that program and it won't um, divert any of the resources that the students who are attending the, the college in person are paying through their student activity fee or through their uh, student technology fee. Okay, any other questions? Can I ask a question? Okay. I, I had a question. Um, so, you, Matt, you mentioned this is an entrepreneurial exercise by the School of Public Health, but my understanding is that the School of Public Health is, has a structural deficit, and so in sense, the School of Public Health is subsidized through New York State uh, tax levy dollars. And so my, my question is, are we going to be supporting out-of-state students through tax levy dollars, and, which makes it seem somewhat problematic? Uh, well, the, the School of Public Health um, does not have a structural deficit. Um, you know, they're a school that's growing, and so, um, but they have, they do not have a structural deficit for the current year, um, and haven't had had a deficit. Um, they um, their enrollment has been has been very strong, um, has been growing, and and their uh, research activity. I think they are now in the top five or six of all CUNY campuses in terms of research activity. So um, they've been doing a really good job in growing growing their, their enrollment and growing their research activity. Um, and the entrepreneurial nature I was referring to is the fact that they are creating new online 
degree programs. Um, and for a new school, that's important to, to make sure that they continue to grow. Um, like a lot of our colleges, they have space limitations um, because they are in leased space. And so I think by developing online programs, they can grow their enrollment without having um, a significant impact on the limited space that they have in their building on 125th Street. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, I'll move approval of item 3A. Do I have a second? Um, Trustee Fair, this is Razia Ravi. I'd like to make um, the motion to amend this resolution um, because this has really two parts, and um, we would like to actually separate the two parts and vote on them separately or possibly to strike out the $75 online infrastructure, infrastructure fee on a separate resolution. Well, first, let's do first things first. Is there a second to my motion? Burger seconds. Second. Okay. Now, you wish to offer an amendment, Ms. Arabi. What is the sure. amendment? I would like to remove the charge of a $75 online infrastructure fee to not be voted under the resolution 3A. So you want to remove everything after the comma and that they are charged a $75 online infrastructure fee for each term of enrollment? So that is the, off the um, your, that's the amendment that you're offering? Correct. So you'll need okay. a second for that amendment, right? Okay. Is there a second? Well, Ms. can, can Ms. Arabi make the motion? She can um, ask to, to have that put a, a revised, an amended resolution put on, but the only way it gets put on the calendar is if she gets, puts on the agenda is if she gets a second to even consider it as amended. Is there a second to Ms. Arabi's motion? Is there a second? I'm sorry, the motion fails. For want of a second. I think we'll now vote. Um, one more qu one more item of discussion, um, Chairman Ferrer. Uh, I think Kason, sure. one of the student alternates, did ask a question about whether or not there'd be an association made to govern the funding. Almost every single, not almost, every proposal that has came to the board in the term of a fee has also accompanied some sort of student voice um, into how that fee is going to be spent, even from the proposed student wellness fee. That also had a subcommittee locally that would determine how funding was being spent. The tech fee committees on local campuses, every single campus has student representation there. For us to set the precedent of inst like including fees without having some sort of governing consulting body from the student side, I think that's very irresponsible of the board, and I don't think that we should move forward with that unless we have some sort of consultation on the back end. Um, just because it says in a resolution that it will be spent on three things, doesn't mean that when it gets to the campus, those are the three things that will be spent on. And it's super important that grad students are not consulted just in the beginning, but also in the end of this process. And I think that, if the, again, if the board moves forward with this and does not separate that, you know, it'll be setting a, a very, very bad precedent that I do not think that this board should be setting in a practice that we should not be entertaining, especially right now, um, you know, in the midst of all this craziness. There should at least be some sort of student consultation. Um, you know, towards this. And I, I really think that there should be an amendment here to include that, like, association or that, like, well, there, at least there's a three-person committee that includes the student government president at SPH. This should not just be a, a fee that's just imposed on students without any consultation as to where this money is going to go in the future. Would a member of the chancellor's staff care to weigh in on this? Um, there, there is a graduate student association um, at the School of Public Health, and, and Dean El Mohandes, and I'm, I'm sorry, he, he couldn't be on the call, but he did consult with them um, prior to bringing this to the board. Um, and, you know, they will, you know, as, as the graduate student council of the school, they'll continue to have a voice. Um, you know, creating a whole, a, a separate association just for this fee, um, Create some administrative costs that um, are inherent with creating a new association, which we've we 
have talked about with the student activity fee recently. Um, so I, um, I would have concerns about that um, because the revenue would have, to, some of the revenue would have to be used to, um, to cover those administrative costs of an association. But um, we can certainly uh, work with Dino Mohandes and make sure that we come back to this committee with a report on how the funds are being used um, as part of other reporting we do on fees um, for academic excellence fees and others. Um, so we can, we can, you know, ensure that that happens um, and work with the school and with the dean to um, come back to this committee and report on the uses of, of those revenues. And how the student government would participate in that? The, and how the student I would, government would participate in that? Right now, the, the student government um, at the School of Public Health was consulted um, on this item, and my understanding is was supportive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 sorry, the dean just uh, emailed me, and, and uh, he said it was agreed to by the Graduate Student Association. Oh, yeah. okay. So I definitely understand so that, please? but I don't think that was Trustee Ferrer's question. His question was, will they be continued to be consulted with the spending of the money? Which is which is hence the reason why we're talking about the association. Mm -hmm. And I don't I haven't heard an answer so to that. I didn't yet. I didn't trust me, Hunter, I didn't use the word continue, but I accept the clarification. So my suggestion is that um there's there's uh they follow the structure at um for the tech fee, right? So we could use a model similar to the tech fee in terms of a consultation that would include uh, student input into how the, the fees are used. And that's something that we just worked out um, in, in, a, in, in a consultative way. So that might be a way more, you know, to move forward. So we can come back to the committee uh, next time and address how uh, that's going to be implemented in a way that includes the student voices, which is what I'm hearing from uh, Trustee Hunter and others. Uh, I think that's the fine. dean just emailed me that um, I asked him the, your question whether um, the graduate students council would continue to be consulted, and he said yes, they will, of course. Okay. I'd, I'd like Is to make a point, if I may. Who's this? Professor Verzani. Sorry, I have uh, my hand up, but I can't see it. I'm sorry, uh, I can't see it. Yeah, so I, I think Trustee Hunter is making an excellent point. I think the Chancellor makes it clear that we can uh, decouple this particular fee from the motion and come back next month or next meeting where there's a concrete uh, spelled out proposal that uh, people understand the parameters of. And I would um, hopefully uh, like to second the motion that was previously on the floor and if not, re-raise it and hopefully it finds another second. So you should Professor formally Bajani. put it back. Let's try, let's try to do this in an orderly way. There's been a motion and a second. There was a motion to amend the uh, fee, and that failed for lack of a second. So I'm sorry, we're at the vote now. If you, want to, if you would like to amend this later, by all means. But we're at a vote right now. All those... Are can you can you not amend a can you not amend a motion before the vote? You already did that. The motion failed. The, the second failed, and the motion failed to amend the original motion. If you want to do that later, you want to change this later by all means. But we have a motion on the floor, and it has been seconded. Is there any anybody opposed or abstain? I abstain. Um, I oppose. Okay. Neil, you have that? Yep, Rosie opposes and John is abstaining. So okay. that means you've got, I just want to make sure you have enough votes. 
So you have um, you and um, Henry and um, I don't, I can't see, is Trustee Sunshine still on the phone? So three, I'm here. Um, I'm on the audio, great. but I'm here. Okay, great. So they got one, two, three, and then you need, is Trustee Thompson still on the phone? Trustee Schwartz is, and I support it. Excellent. Thank you, Barry. So now you have four. Okay. Thank you. There are no further uh, items on the agenda. Um, I'd like to ask before I move to adjourn that uh, we have a fulsome report on the issues that have been raised by um, faculty and students on uh, on this fee for the for the next meeting, um, and uh, also a report on. Uh, the uh, audits with respect to the uh, um, excellence fees that was promised uh, some time ago. Yep. Uh, I, we uh, spoke recently with our internal audit office about the excellence fees, and so uh, we'll be happy to come back on that and um, and have uh, Dean El Mohandas uh, online for the next meeting as well, so he can report back on the online infrastructure fee at the School of Public Health. Yeah, good. It's, it's apparent that this item will be revisited at some point, so better do it sooner rather than later. There are no more items on the agenda. I move we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. I take it those beeps are seconds. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks very much, everybody.